uh, redesign project from the administrative and content management point of view. Instead of a detailed case study with lists like how many nodes were migrated and so on, we will tell stories about Japan, intercultural communication, and how our team addresses the challenges of creating and maintaining a bilingual website for a Japanese university with an international community. We will also um, offer some information about Japanese public outsourcing contracts and share our um, translation workflows if we have time. My name is Michael Cooper, a manager of digital content brand and design in the Communications and Public Relations Division of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, so that's O-I-S-T, and so we say OIST, or in Japanese, OISTO. And my colleague, Chris Wu, is our senior web developer. Um, and all, vo all, vi all views expressed here are my own. I do not uh, represent the university, and no part of the presentation should be considered an endorsement except for uh, you going to see Chris uh, offer his full tour of development and design issues uh, that you face when using CJK, which is Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, in web projects. So as a Taiwanese front-end developer trained in product design in Germany, who currently works in an English language university in Japan, he has experience and perspective that is not easy to come by. So please don't miss that. So when I arrived in rural Japan in 1994, I had no Japanese training. I was teaching myself. And I had a desk in an uh, office of retired school principals. The average age of everybody was about 70 or so. So from the first day, they kept asking me gaijin questions. Gaijin means foreigner. Like, can you use, can you use chopsticks or uh, do you like sushi? And I had never tried it. So I, I used the dictionary and replied, wakarimasen. So wakarimasen can mean either I don't know, which was what I was trying to say, I don't know if I like it or not, or it can mean I don't understand. So my very senior colleagues, thinking that I did not understand the question, did what every reasonable person does when um, talking to a foreigner who doesn't understand them. Uh, they simply said it louder again and again in exactly the same words, and then they started adding gestures until it became a game of charades, you know, going fishu and, and things like that, and they had a really good time. And then one day, I finally got to the lesson in my Japanese book that I was using that teaches you the equivalent of I have never, which is shutakoto arimasen. So I triumphantly walked into the audience the next day and said, sushi wa tabata koto ga arimasen. And then all of them sort of as though they'd just woken up. They put down what they were doing and they uh, brought me to lunch. And I had my first sushi. So my problem and the error I was making is called linguistic interference. This is when a speaker's first language interferes with their acquisition of a second. I was a naive language learner, assuming that the structures and expressions of my mother tongue were universal, that other languages were simply different vocabulary that was switched out with what I already knew. Now in web development, this would be like adding a language to a website by just adding a new PO file or installing a machine, language, uh, machine translation plugin uh, without changing anything else or reviewing anything else. So this is acceptable, however, if the additional language is clearly secondary. So there are situations where this is even preferred. If a US consumer from someplace like where I'm from, which is the rural south in the US, uh, buys a luxury bag to feel sophisticated and European, the othering of the translation adds to the appeal. It makes you feel exotic and cosmopolitan, so that's a good thing. Uh, the English translation of the three-body problem by Xi Jin Liu uh, does not feel like it was written in English. But that is by design, according to the Ken Liu, the narrator, the translator, who brought it to the English-speaking world. He writes that the best translations into English do not, in fact, read as if they were originally written in English. The English words are arranged in such a way that the reader sees a glimpse of another culture's patterns of thinking and feels a tremor of another people's gestures and movements. And Chinese history and culture are very core to the, his to the story of the three-body problem, so Liu keeps you aware of that, the fact that you are reading a translation. I recommend the book, it's terrifying. So, uh, however, our university, in our university, neither English nor Japanese versions of the website can be allowed to feel foreign or to feel like a translation. Our translation process is not localization. When I talk about our website's two languages, I refer to them as sides. I say the English side or the Japanese side. Neither is secondary. Both are essential. So please let me explain why. Uh, Japan passed a law in 2007 to create OIST as a new type of university with independent governance and public funding, making it a testbed for new ways to do education and science in Japan. 
OIST is a graduate university and all students do the same program. It's a PhD, five-year PhD in science. There are no other majors, there are no other departments. All, all education and research is conducted entirely in English. There are no departments, as I said. Everything from administration to architecture is designed to encourage cross-disciplinary research. And the university's 242 students represent over 50 countries and territories. Over 80% of students and over 60% of faculty are from outside Japan. And when you combine students and employees, about half of the community is international. And this is in a country where only 1.6 of the population is non-Japanese. That is a very, very low rate, a very low number of immigrants and foreigners in a country, especially for someone from a post-colonial nation like myself, or from those of you who are from Europe with all of your land borders. So Okinawa itself is also atypical within Japan and in Asia. Okinawa was an occupied territory of the US until 1972. That is the year my wife was born. It's also the year that the movie The Godfather was released. That is how recently J uh, Okinawa was a territory of a foreign country. However, it has um, developed rapidly in these 50 years. It has the youngest population in the country of all the other prefectures, and it has a very creative entertainment industry and a very lively entrepreneur scene. However, it still ranks last on metrics like average income and economic achievement. I'm sorry, academic achievement. Now, closer to Seoul, Shanghai, and Taipei than it is to Tokyo, Okinawa was historically an Asian trading hub. And one reason for founding OIST here in Okinawa was for it to act as a catalyst to create an economic innovation hub in the region. The relationship between language and identity for OIST audiences and stakeholders is particularly complex. If you sell coffee beans, uh, your stakeholders are the roasters, your audience is the consumer, it's very, very clear and direct. You have a single message and a single voice, but for OIST, stakeholders and audience overlap and differ across language and geographical boundaries, requiring us to speak with more than one voice. So we need Japanese speaking taxpayers and policymakers, this is the Prime Minister by the way, to know that OIST is worth the investment by demonstrating how it benefits Okinawa and Japan. But we also need to convince the mainly English speaking worldwide community of scientists and entrepreneurs that they will benefit from working with OIST. So OIST must be two very different things to two very different communities. To maintain support from Okinawa, OIST has to be fully a part of the local community. But to be accepted as a peer by the international science community, OIST has to be truly global. This means the website has to treat both Japanese and English as the primary, the first language. Neither can be secondary. We cannot make the same mistake at OIST that I made with sushi. We cannot replace the words of an English design. We must tailor the content language and UX for both communities. We must speak with multiple voices. The current site, which is the old site, uh, launched the day we became a graduate university, and it matched the university's needs at the time. We had to rebrand the promotion corporation as a university with a new logo and a new color. We did not yet have students. We did not yet have a business development arm. Uh, so the content was mainly science and institutional news stories. OIST was the first university, uh, public university, and maybe university, in Japan to use uh, Drupal as far as I know. Maybe someone can uh, tell me. And the most notable feature of the website was the way every page switched between languages instead of sending the user to the top page of a separate English website with content that was usually outdated and incomplete. In the 10 years since the website debuted, we have almost tripled the number of faculty and grown to over 1,000 students and staff. We now have five la lab buildings, a startup incubator, on-campus child care center, an auditorium, a conference center, student and faculty housing, and a seaside marine, service, uh, s marine science research station. When asked about OIST challenges, a uh, German particle physicist and OIST board member Albrecht Wagner described it as a rather young university which had no example to follow. So everything had to be invented from scratch. And so it underwent the typical problems you face when you have young children, when they go through all sorts of child sicknesses and you have to deal with them one after the other. Drupal's flexibility enabled us to accommodate this rapid change and growth with a small staff. But the university is now like a teenager who has quickly outgrown their clothes, or in this case, the website. In Japan, April is the start of the new fiscal year. It's also the start of the academic year and the time when new graduates join the workforce. So it is, the it is kind of a rite of passage to get your fresher's suit. 
uh, which is a young adult's first tailored business suit. Actually, the term fresher was originally freshman, but they updated that during the era of womenomics uh, to include more women in, in, in the idea, women joining the workforce. OIST, too, having outgrown its website, is now ready for its first tailored fresher suit, a website built to accommodate its current size and needs. And since we are a very small team, we worked with Drupal agencies, and that means outsourcing. At the suggestion of one of our contractors, I would like to share with you some information about contracting with Japanese public institutions. In Japan, the fiscal year begins with spring and ends with winter, spanning from April 1st to March 31st. And Japanese public funded institutions operate within a strict fiscal year with no guarantee of budget in the next one. So no contract is allowed to span over one year for us. Each budget is also fixed. So once the contract is done, the work has to be adjusted to fit within the deadline and the budget. This is why we had to split this multi-year web project into phases or stages. The vendor for each stage is chosen by either price or proposal competition, and a committee makes the final decision. The same contractor can compete for successive contracts, but choosing the same vendor again and again will raise suspicion. It could affect your career. So contracts cannot bridge multiple fiscal years. Uh, it is difficult to use the same vendor for successive years, and this means that the project ends up being done by different partners. So with every change in consultant and vendor, momen momentum and time are lost as the new vendor digests and often offers improvements on work done by the previous vendor. And all the while this is happening, the university and what it is, re what it is modeled by the website are changing. So on the one hand, we could finish sooner and cheaper with a single integrated contract, but on the other, we do get the benefit of working with expertise from more than one uh, vendor. Please note that Japanese private businesses are different. And also note that subcontracting is only allowed if you can prove in writing that it's necessary to hire a subcontractor after you get the contract. And you need to tell that before, or it could be invalidated. Um, this is to prevent a cascade of contractors taking a cut and then subcontracting to smaller companies. And there was an actual sort of scandal about this, which is why we have this rule. Now, let me switch to giving you some examples of what we have learned and continue to learn from designing a new website for the university. Please note that this is a work in progress, that we are still using the old website while we prepare the content for the launch. The current website on the left was designed to establish the new logo and brand color called Vital Red. And we did so by restricting ourselves to the brand color, black and white, only those three colors. The brand color ended up being the color for both links and emphasis like alert and CTAs. So as our user research showed, too much red meant that users did not know what to focus on. It was just red everywhere. So in the new design, we have added a palette of contrasting secondary colors to make the logo and brand color stand out. If you look on the right side, you can tell that the logo really does shine because you have less distraction from around it. When you launch a new identity, it's tempting to overdo it, like someone talking incessantly about, they started how, about how they have started CrossFit. But we have to remember that if everything is the focus, then nothing is the focus. So to plan and execute our user research, we worked with English-speaking contractors. So all the materials and events were conducted in English. However, I translated all the materials into Japanese, conducted separate Japanese sessions, and translated the results back to the vendor. Since all, Jap all OIST employees are fluent and literate in English, you might think this is unnecessary, but I had a very good reason, and this is a very good lesson. In a previous job, I got a great lesson in intercultural communication. The dean of faculty was chairing a meeting in which we were wrestling with a difficult problem. The Westerners were throwing out ideas and arguing while the Japanese quietly nodded and made notes. We were getting nowhere when the dean stopped the conversation and politely added a, uh, asked a Japanese colleague to comment. This shy professor offered a detailed analysis and insights that no one had yet considered and which were the key to finding a solution. This left her more vocal colleagues embarrassed, and I know that because I was one of them. When your culture tells you that progress is only achieved by a rapid back and forth exchange, you will find silence, you will, find, you will fill every silence to keep that tennis volley of ideas going back and forth. But if your cultural background has taught you to wait for a graceful silence before humbly offering your opinion, you will find yourself waiting for the right moment to jump in. So Western colleagues might feel that each participant must make the effort to speak up, but sometimes you must make the effort not to speak to allow less assertive voices to be heard. And the moderator in this discussion had the experience and wisdom to create that space for us. So even though Japanese colleagues participated in the user research workshops, the Japanese language workshops produced candid Japanese perspectives and insights that, I would have other, uh, that we would have otherwise mis missed out on had we not done it. So in user research, 
As in discussions in general, language and communication style matter. Even in the same language community, please make sure to create space for less assertive pa participants to talk or risk on losing out on ideas and insights. So, moving on to more concrete lessons learned. Uh, the, our current website has several layers of long pull-down menus and many links send the user to an organic group site on a different server. Using organic groups was indispensable for us to keep up with the rapid growth of the university in those first 10 years, uh, but it has resulted in a disjointed user experience for the following reasons. One, the change in look and feel after the jump is jarring and disorienting. Two, the organic group sites are managed directly by content owners who are in specific sections or divisions. Uh, so the sites sin tend to be too detailed for a user who is new to OIST. And three, because each site is managed by a particular working group of people that corresponds to the org chart, the navigation has come to mirror the org chart rather than, the f ra rather than reflect the needs of the user. So how to fix this? In the new site, we have reduced the number of menu choices at each level and added landing pages to act as context-rich navigation hubs. Fewer choices at each stage of navigation reduces cognitive burden and encourages users to read all options before choosing. Our user research showed that when there were too many choices, users took the first one that seemed close to their goal and almost never read the entire list. Now, to reflect the university's priorities, but also to justify moving so many divisions and sections down a level in the top bar navigation on our website, we base the, no the top navigation on our official strategic goals. Uh, as I just mentioned, jumping straight from top level item to user managed organic groups has resulted in an org chart based navigation. In the new site, we group information by what audiences want, not by who is in charge of it. First example. Web articles have been split by topic and audience. Web articles about institutional news and media com coverage are now called just news, and they sit under, about or, or under what is OIST. Like the about OIST part, they define the university and report how it is being presented in the media. Web articles about research are now under, re under research as research updates. And then our business and industry innovation division joins procurement under a, new t under a new title, which is doing business with us, because this is the part of the website that buys and sells, conducts transactions, and works with industry and business. However, everyone in their office wants to be on the home page and at the top of the menu, so we had to explain and justify the benefit of this new architecture and, and get buy-in. Uh, many of our content owners said that the following was a useful way to express it, to explain it. If you go to a dinner party at a friend's house, the host will introduce you to their friends. The host says, hey, this is Levinci, he's a medical technology exec, and this is Yatunde, she's a doctor, and this is OIST, a uh, science and technology graduate university. And this introduction by your host to these other people, these other guests who don't know you, is the homepage itself. Then, based on that introduction, guests ask you questions to get to know more, if they want to know more. Levinci, he's interested, and his question is that first navigation choice, the first link that is clicked on the home page. Then you respond to him with more choices and more context to help him choose where he wants to go next. That is the landing page. So this, uh, this explanation turned out to be quite useful with uh, the content owners uh, because they understand that every step in the user journey we give the user a context-rich overview of the topic and then set of links to learn more, letting them find their way to the information they want without boring or confusing them. It's that balance between boredom and confusion. So that brings me to one of our biggest challenges in the new information architecture. User testing with TreeJack showed that when asked to find information about a given topic, be it biophysics or cancer research, the user starts by looking for a list of departments. They have been conditioned by looking at other university websites. Um, and peer analysis showed us that most universities do organize their content by departments because it's an administrative reality. The problem is that we don't have departments. We have no departments. And that is one of our biggest selling points. Our cross-disciplinary approach to research encourages faculty and students to combine research disciplines to find new answers and new questions. So we had to find a new way to allow the user to navigate our growing list of research units without undermining this focus on cross-disciplinary research. Luckily, our faculty had been making a taxonomy to describe their research in their own terms. The visualization set up by Chris shows the relationships between tags and units. As you can see, the relationships are neither exclusive nor restrictive. So we use this controlled taxonomy as the main organizing principle for the research content. Instead of just tagging content, we use these terms as the main skeleton of the site. 
linking news articles, research units, faculty members, courses, and even job posts. And in the future, we plan to link events as well. But to make it clear that these are not departments or restricted categories, we call them research specialties. But then there was an additional challenge. The taxonomy, at its birth, at its, at its inception, already had 52 terms. And we were told that it would grow as new faculty were added to the university. 52 is already large for a single user to browse through. And as uh, some of the topics are very, very specific, like biophysics and polymer chemistry. Um, and don't forget that user research showed that users will not read through the entire list if it is too long. But again, thanks to our faculty, we were able to designate a smaller number of broader specialties to group related ones. And we call these research disciplines. They're not departments. You can see here that biology and physics are disciplines, and they group together the research specialties. They don't group research units, and that was a very important point of, uh, for the faculty. They don't want to be grouped by these broad categories. So in this visualization, the research specialties are the red dots, and the research disciplines are the large blue ones. Now, on the website, the page for biology, as a research discipline, shows all the research specialties it represents. One of these is biology, and another is biophysics. The page for physics also lists biophysics. So the research specialty page for biophysics lists both physics and biologies as research disciplines that it's related to, and as well as the tagged research units, courses, jobs, and science news articles. This is a content pillar. This is a gathering of all of the things that are tagged by that. At first, I was worried about structuring our content around 42 and growing tags many of which are too specific for non-specialists, but I realized that having navigation hubs for topics like polymer chemistry, deep matter physics, and biology, we are riding the long tail, helping geeks to find their tribe, helping people discover that the niche that they love is one of our strengths. And if you are searching for polymer chemistry on the web, and you find an entire page dedicated to it, including things like research news, courses, and even job posts, you will definitely want to know more about that institution. And that's our goal. So it is true that with such specific topics, we might miss someone searching for fields we do not work in. So stuff like dentistry or veterinarian science, but we don't have anything to offer those people. When you define what you are, you also define what you are not, and that is the definition of a definition. So other challenges can come from the culture of Japan. Um, for example, of these two university directory screenshots, who thinks the lower one looks better? Not a real participatory group, that's cool. But um, at first we thought that it did. Um, however, uh, the centerpiece of a Japanese funeral service is the EA, which is a portrait of the deceased in a thick black frame. Please don't be sad about this young man, by the way. He is not dead. He is a funeral director, and this image is used on his company website to demonstrate how he can Photoshop an old image into a responsible and very presentable funeral photo. However, this is a real one. This is the EA of the late former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. And you can see, this has been in the news a lot lately, you can see that it is not always shoulders up, but the common point of this, sometimes they have ribbons on it, but is that it's a thick black frame. So we just avoid thick black frames around portraits altogether. Now, in some cases, the Japanese language itself complicates design and development. Um, my colleague Chris will go into this more detail on Thursday. Please go to see that talk. But Japanese characters take up more horizontal space in the design. They're more complicated. And Japanese does not use white space. Uh, you know, computers and, and the web and all of this was, uh, was created for English, for an alphabetic system with white space in it. And Asian languages have a, l a lot of problems with that. Uh, so this greatly complicates design. For example, the English title of this research unit breaks gracefully at word boundaries, leaving each word intact. However, if you switch to the Japanese version, and one orphan character is left stranded on the second line, and that is the last character of a four-character word. It might look wrong to you, but to a Japanese, it looks wrong. <laughs> that is. But it's really hard to fix. Uh, so please remember that this is a work in progress, right? And I don't mean that this is the redesign of the website is a work in progress. I mean that the goal of us making both English and Japanese sides of the website feel equally native is a work in progress. We're still trying to improve it. We do have Japanese colleagues who ask that we improve the quality and consistency of our Japanese translations and the Japanese interface. And we are trying to do that. The slide did not take note of. You were just trying to example. Oh, up there. At the top, at the top left. Sorry, sorry. The Japanese part of it changed, yes. <laughs> so maintaining every page in both English and Japanese is a lot of work for a lot of people. But first of all, you need 
several things. One, you need a web team that can handle the complications of mixing single byte alphanumeric and double byte CJK character sets. So I, I greatly recommend that you go to see uh, Chris's talk on Thursday. Uh, you also need a content management team that can handle both languages. And you need full-time trained professional translators because it is not a side task, it is a profession that demands the highest respect. And because our translators also work for projects for other clients in the university, we must optimize their time and effort. To do that, you need a good workflow. So we have been improving ours, so I would like to share it with you. We manage our team's content creation task in our project management system. We recently moved from JIRA to Shortcut. Um, ask Chris if you want to know more uh, about why we decided to do so. While a developer might say, well, you, you can do everything directly in Drupal, this might be true, but it's not practical, and other teams have their preferred tools, and we really don't have the right to tell people how to do their jobs, especially when we're asking them for so much. So we start with the SharePoint document, where we work with content owners on the source material, which is usually in English. Once the source material is uh, finalized, we add translations of proper nouns, like people, programs, and organizations. You see, um, like Chris's name in Japanese, or my name in Japanese, it's not a given. It's a choice. Somebody with power makes that choice when you translate a name into Japanese. Just like if you're in a university, you start a new program or a new, a new department or something like that. You choose the name by committee, usually. And that's quite arbitrary. So it's better to just get that in there at the beginning to save the translation team a lot of time. Then we run it through DeepL, which is a machine translation service, to get a rough AI translation vocabulary. It saves time uh, because it looks up all the terms for you, it gives you a suggestion about what it is, but you do have to check it. So we can't use the machine translation as it is, so our bilingual content team and our members do a quick check, and then we send it to the pros, the translation team, and they turn it into a piece of well-written Japanese that matches the tone and effect of the original. So, once the Japanese team has finalized the content, the website editors make the changes on the English and Japanese sides of the website. And that's the whole flow of it. It involves a lot of people. <laughs> it involves a lot of work. Um, so, uh, at this point, how are we on time? Is it time for Q&A? Mm. It's 42 now, so we still have time. Okay, so I was going to offer you um, our uh, video uh, well, let me give a brief example of how just a menu title can and should be influenced by the goals of the organization it represents. OIST has two teams working on community outreach, and they have agreed to collaborate on a user-centered list of landing pages. Uh, during planning, we realized that for the landing page title, we will need more than translation. Uh, during planning, and then the, the English language community only needs to know that, we will, that they will be joining a, a uh, sort of socially responsible organization that helps the community. In contrast, the local Japanese community is looking for events and programs they can join. And local Japanese stakeholders want to know and confirm that we are working for and with the local community. So instead of using the loan word, uh, so outreach as in the English title is fine. And there is a loan word uh, equivalent that is used by some organizations, which is autorichi. But we didn't use that because we needed to give more concrete example that we were really doing stuff. It's not just, you know, mouth service. So we chose ippang, gakko muke katsudo, which means activities for general public and schools. This is stuff that you can do with us, right? Uh, lastly, and this is very brief and very complicated, but uh, we've also been doing a lot of captioning of videos, and we've found a really good workflow that I would like to share with you. Video captions are good for accessibility because you want people who cannot hear the audio to get the same quantity and quality of information that the hearing public does, right? That's the idea behind accessibility. It must be equal regardless of what handicap or what disability you have. In the same spirit, we want English-speaking and Japanese-speaking viewers to get the same information. So captions work for both bilingualism and accessibility. So it's a high priority for me, but it is the most taxing and the most resource-heavy thing that we do. So uh, a quick rundown of what ha is working for us right now, just in case you're in a position to use this information. And you can contact me and get more information uh, later, but it is quite dense. So we use machine transcription and human translation, right? So if the event has m simultaneous interpretation, get an audio track of that, record that, but don't transcribe it, okay? Because that's not going to work. 
Uh, simultaneous interpretation is hard, and you're always behind the original speaker. You have to drop stuff in order to keep pace. You make errors. You can't go back and check them. You can't ask them uh, for clarification, right? So it's just going to be a reference. So just take that as audio, keep it. Then, if the event is a mixture of people speaking in different languages, and this happens at our university a lot, we'll have two people on stage, one speaking English, one speaking Japanese, and it's simultaneous interpretation. So the Japanese speakers are listening to simultaneous interpretation of English. The English speakers are listening to the Japanese part. And those of us who understand both, we're just listening, right? But you're going to get an audio file which has English, Japanese, English, Japanese, English, Japanese in the same one. So first, you have to separate those audio tracks inside Final Cut, in inside uh, Premiere Pro into a Japanese-only track, English-only track. Don't mess with the times, just split them. And then you take these two uh, and you put them through the Adobe uh, Premiere Pro speech-to-text feature to transcribe each one of them separately. Then you get a native speaker of each language to correct the machine transcription because Adobe makes errors. It, it doesn't know that our university is called OIST and the number of things that it, miss <laughs> that it puts in there instead of that is hilarious. And there's lots of fun. Uh, we, we often, we'll, when we're checking these, we, uh, we go back and forth to the translators and go, <laughs> hey, listen to this one. <laughs> it's really fun, but um, it is a lot of work. So you get a native speaker to correct the machine transcription while listening to the original audio. Then, edit the captions for each track. So you go into uh, Premiere, and you widen out, you combine as many of them as possible to give the translators as big a chunk of the language as possible for them to translate. Because English and Japanese, it's SOV and SVO, subject, verb, object, and subject, optic, verb, right? You have different orders of stuff, and so it's very hard to translate word for word. The bigger the chunk, the better the translation. So you want to combine those together. Then. You, um, you save each set of captions to a separate SRT file. SRT is a text file format. It's just uh, the, file, the file extension is SRT, but it is just text. It has time codes and it has the text inside it. Save those. Then you send those to the translation team. You change it to TXT, send it to the translation team. You add them, ask them to add the translation under the transcription that's in there for each line, but not to touch the time codes and not to use a word or anything like that. Then you get those back. You combine them. I'm going to shorten this very, very much, but then you get the, uh, the separate English and Japanese SRT, the, the text back from them. You change it back to SRT, put it back into, um, in, in, into Premiere, and then you put it back together so that you have a single caption, uh, a caption layer for English and a single caption layer for Japanese. Your goal here is that you end up with when you're watching it, regardless of, um, of whether they're speaking English or Japanese, the person speaking, you see what there's written underneath it, right? It's not just the translated parts, it's the whole thing. So it's a transcription that also serves as a translated caption, okay? That's your goal. And producing it, obviously, from this explanation, is quite an ordeal, but it's well worth it. Because uh, we have a growing number of, of videos on our site which can be seen by people who are hard of hearing and people who don't understand the source language. And uh, then you take those SRT files, you upload them to YouTube and video when you upload your video, and you have a perfectly human translated, understandable uh, bilingual video. You can use YouTube's, what YouTube puts out for you, but those are justifiably called craptions because they don't make sense in either language. <laughs> okay, and, and that really concludes my comments, so I guess we move on to Q&A. So if you have any question, you can use the app to submit the live QA, or I will dispatch the microphone to you if you have a question here. Thank you. Uh, did you find yourself uh, needing to change the structure of pages for different languages, or meaning Japanese versus English, because of the way you would convey the message? Mm. So Chris is going to go through the, the technical aspects of like um, when, you, when you do the translations and having to make the chunks bigger and how to use the T function, having context when you're using the T function, stuff like that. But other than that, um, simply because it is such an ordeal to do so, we don't do that often, but I think a couple of times we actually have done that, yes. Uh, but it's, it's not so much because of the language, it's more because of the audience. See, that's the, that's the thing I was trying to express, right? The language and the audience, they're overlapped. 
And so what you're emphasizing, what order you're emphasizing it in, whether it's relevant to this language community or not, and that does affect the layout of some pages, yes. Thank you. Chris, do you have anything to add to, add to that? Yeah, I think the, the context is really important because sometimes English words has verb and noun together. And in Japanese, <coughs> they are totally different words. Yeah. So we have to implement more context to make the translation more correct, uh, especially on the UI. Yeah, so for example, something that, uh, that Chris might uh, be, I think he is addressing on Thursday, is that uh, you, know, you have you know, the word contact in the website means like who you would contact, right? And then there's a button that you click to actually contact somebody, right? In Japanese, those are two different terms. That's, toi, that's you know, toi awase saki or uh, denak saki, and then there's, you know, denak or toi awase or, you know, some other things you could say, kontakto. Uh, they, dif they differ depending on the context because it's not a one for one. It's not the sushi thing, right? It, you need context to determine what the translation is. Next. Chris, someone over here? Chris, Chris. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned accessibility. I'm a product designer. I work specifically in accessibility. And I'm interested in how you build that into your flow, if you do. Sounds like you do. Mm. And whether or not you get a lot of pushback. And if you do get pushback, how do you overcome that? And basically, yeah, mm. that process. Yeah, the, the organization's been growing and changing so fast. And uh, both of us have done training at the... Um, What's the place in Utah? I've forgotten the name now. Um, the, the place at the University of Utah that, that specialized in WebAIM. 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 We've both done training at WebAIM and accessibility, and it's very important to both of us. Um, and so we sort of start out with accessibility as a standard built in, but for things that demand a lot of resources, like captioning the videos, there is pushback, yeah. Um, you, you explain it to the content owners and to the people who have authority, at, you know, that we have the whole language thing and the accessibility aspect of it. So it, it makes it easier to pass, I think. Because when you say you're going to be alienating a stakeholder, then it's a much, more com much more convincing than saying that you have to be compassionate for people who cannot understand it. So unfortunately, <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say. Yeah, I think uh, to answer the question about the UX, I think we can go, go to the, the diagram. Because oh that yeah, is yeah. a very important one. Because uh, our professor, they because they are di interdisciplinary, they are not like to be categorized into one small section or category. So we have to try to convince them uh, we n we do need a smaller set of the category to help user to navigate to your unit. Yeah. So we use the uh, you you see the the three circles diagram. So the the inner inner part is our uh, suggested. Uh, category, and we show yes. them how how can user access to our website by looking at the, for example, the chemistry, uh, the bio uh, biology, the the simple term that user may mm -hmm. understand easily if they are uh, not a general academia audience. So we use that to convince them, and they finally they, they accept that. So they, they was a quite kind of a. Oh, uh, no, it was, yeah. It long, was, it we were long discussion. <laughs> let's just stop there and say it was quite. <laughs> but, um, but the, uh, you know, uh, cognitive burden and uh, sensory integration, these are also accessibility issues. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Actually, the, so a funny thing is that the, uh, the faculty, when we showed them this, they said, oh, this is great. It really shows how interdisciplinary we are. Let's use this as the interface for the website. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're brilliant people, but, you know, you have to sort of explain this would be an accessibility nightmare. Um, I can't even use it because I'm too old to see the, all the letters and my hands shake, you know, it's just, mm. Next. Uh, first of all, thanks for a, for a great talk. Uh, that was all very, very interesting. Thanks. With the organization, the university's commitment to having, you know, the English side and the Japanese side, and obviously the, the effort and the cost that must go into maintaining both sides of that translation. Hmm. Is that something that was always there in the university from day one, or is that something that had to get developed and, and built into the culture over time? And if so, how was that achieved? Uh, no, actually it was, um, well, I mean, the commitment to the bilingual website was there from the beginning, but um, the origins of, uh, of, of the project is that uh, Koji Omi, who is this politician, he was, 
at one time he was made the minister for Okinawan affairs because there's this minister for, especially for Okinawan and northern affairs because they are kind of economically disadvantaged. And then he was also made at the same time the minister for technology. And he said, oh, well, I'll combine these and you know, I'll, I'll make this thing. And then he teamed up with Akito Arima, who was the former president of uh, Tokyo University. And uh, when he was at Tokyo University, he tried to internationalize Tokyo University, and he just got pushed back and pushed back, and he just got so frustrated. He said, no, you know, great, fine. I'll create an international science and technology university with this guy Kojiomi as far away from Tokyo as possible. I, I don't think that he was that spiteful about it, but that's what happened, you know. And so some people have called us a skunk works, you know. Something that's very, very, you know, experimental, and they put it as far away from the capital as possible, just in case it blows up. But um, it's working out very, very well. So from the beginning, uh, the charter was that it would be over half non-Japanese. Um, and as I as I mentioned, 1.6 percent, folks. You know, uh, that's an amazingly small number of people who are who are foreign living in the country. And uh, he really wanted to make an, a very, you know, essentially international place to open up Japanese science and, and innovation to the world. And we're making slow progress on it. I mean, it's not too slow, but, you know, it's a tough thing to do. And we're getting there. We just had our 10th anniversary, so. Hello. So you guys uh, seem to have a long-term vision on uh, these multidisciplinary things. Uh, <laughs> how do you prevent uh, becoming those blue dots in the center of your diagram, becoming di departments? <laughs> uh, okay, so we don't have to try to prevent that because our faculty and our students come to us. They, they, they leave places like MIT or they say no to places like Caltech and they come to us because that's what they want. It's the biggest draw for these people. Um, you know, it, when you are a, a professor at some American universities, you spend all your time writing grant proposals. Um, you're in the physics department, so you can't use this DNA machine or something like that. Or the equipment is owned by a particular unit. You can't get to it. You can't try out new things very easily. Um, we have our main equipment is all in a, this common uh, department where there are technicians and people to help you use them. So if you are a physicist and you say, you know what? This postdoc has a good idea. Let's try using DNA analysis and combine that with this mathematical model and do this and do something completely new. It's very, very easy to do, and that's the appeal. And if we, if we get departments, then it'll be more and more difficult to do that. The faculty will not allow it. So the, 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 the making this, you know, oh, wow, I've got something different on my screen. It never showed? No. Oh! Dude, wait a minute. <laughs> How do I show it? I have to end the, end the slideshow. So sorry. Oh, it's not going there either. So that's why everybody was laughing. I just thought they liked the, the visualization. Can I just follow up with the answer? Because yeah, I think uh, you asked how to prevent that. I think so it's a, a very good timing to promote Drupal as well. Because there you go. Yeah, Drupal do help us to prevent these kind of things happen. Yeah. So, so we, we have a lot of units. And yeah. at the beginning, when we design this project, uh, we create a content type for unit. And later, we know there are some, some professors, they want to align with the others, create some uh, group, or uh, how was that? The quantum, what? Quantum, uh, qu mm, content pillar? No. Uh, quantum, the quantum physics, they... Uh, condensed. Okay. Yeah, yeah so the they... Theoretical. They will try to uh, group them. For example, the, the marine science station, they will be, mm. for example, three or uh, five different units gathered together. So later we, we, we developed the, uh, another content type for unit collection. So yeah. thanks to the uh, reference. So it will be very easy to bring the existing content, uh, create once and use it all, all over the place. Mm. OK, so that seems it's time. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. I'm very uh, humbled uh, to have so many people attend, and it's a, an honor to have been able to speak here. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> ah. Yeah, so I, I, I brought Okinawan sweets, so they're small shortbreads. The shortbreads are traditional. They contain um, pork fat. They contain lard, but they're little shortbreads. And then also raw cane sugar from Okinawa. And please take as many as you like. This is just all for people who've shown up today. <laughs>